Welcome to a Global Risk Community Chat. Today, our guest is Martina McPherson. I'm very happy to have you here today, Martina. Welcome. Good morning. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yes, likewise. So before we get into our topic for today, can you briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Martina McPherson. I wear multiple hats. I'm the head of ESG product management at SIX, the Swiss Exchanges Group in the financial information function. I'm also a board member at the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets, uh, which is actually a next-gen sustainable finance think tank for education, um, advocacy, and capacity building. And lastly, I wear an academic hat. I'm a visiting fellow and a part-time lecturer at the University of Zurich and Henley Business School. Sounds fun, sounds super diverse as well. So. Well, with that being said, then let's jump into our topic. What uh, what would you like to share with us today? Um, yes, uh, I would like to talk a bit about the importance of an integrated approach for ESNG and potentially corporate sustainability at a company and a product slash a value proposition level. We have just been completing the writing and editing of a new book, which looks at ESG investing and analysis. It's a practitioner's guide that will be published by Risk Books coming out in September. And this is very much designed to be a practical guide or as a practical guide to analyze most up-to-date and common ways in which ESG consideration should be and could be taken into account up and foremost in the investment process as part of a broader value proposition looking, for instance, at screening, integration, and active ownership, but also um, looking at the implications that go broader than this, you know, taking into consideration, for instance, the current regulatory landscape up and foremost here in Europe that is very much changing and adapting towards sustainability disclosure rules, and that what these ultimately mean in turn for, um, again, investment management at the product, but also at the entity level. And maybe to add to that, uh, it's also the topic of an upcoming PhD that I will be undertaking with the University of Cardiff, where I look specifically at the anomalies between um, entity level and product slash disclosure level, when and where modern slavery statements and activities or policies and practices are concerned. Mm. Sounds good. So can you maybe share some key things about then this topic, but as well as maybe combining it with the book that is upcoming? So maybe some aims and findings also from this book, as well as some key things. Sure. Um, ultimately, about the book, you know, we're seeing that there is an increasing appetite um, by investors, by global policymakers and regulators to ultimately a hone down and provide more transparency and disclosure on and how to manage environmental, social and governance slash ESG risks. And they have become a core part of the investment process. But at the same time, you see that financial and extra financial insights, when we talk again about this holistic and integrated approach for ESG, for instance, are not always part of the same side of the coin. And hence, you know, we see that many investors in the mainstream can still find it challenging to identify the different type of streams and the different type of issues that are making up a full and holistic ESNG assessment, an integrated assessment, hence of financial and extra financial factors. And in this book, we are providing on the one hand, theoretic context on how to manage and address, and maybe also make decisions around trade-offs when implementing an environmental, social, and or governance strategy and approach. But we're also making it very practical because we have asked asset owners to literally work with us side by side and to provide some detailed case studies um, that will help literally to shape and bring to light how they're on a daily basis also looking into some of the prevailing systemic issues and risks, for instance, around climate change or biodiversity on the one hand, and how they're actually helping and shaping the agenda for positive change trajectories. You know, for instance, through an approach that encompasses active ownership and corporate potentially sovereign engagement. 
And we are also highlighting specifically in the chapter that we have written, some of the work that still needs to be done to address prevailing controversies. You know, a lot has been written and said about corporate controversies and how they can be addressed, for instance, by screening out and or addressing through a, a, a positive approach, addressing um, global norms and conventions in the investment analyses. But there's still a lot to be said how we are actually on the one hand identifying how we are managing and how we are disclosing controversies that go hand in hand with say a fixed income, a sovereign fixed income approach. And these are exactly the type of layers when and where we are trying to unravel the issues on the one hand, and where we are trying them to provide further insights and also guidance of how investors could address these proactively in their portfolio on the other. Sounds super also interesting, or and I think that it will bring a lot of uh, different outlooks as well as new insights, I think. So I guess when it is out, I would recommend every one of our uh, audience to kind of, you know, look into it or read it. And with that being said, let's then move on to our next question. And that is, if you were to share some takeaway points with our viewers to start maybe implementing on, what would that be in general? Maybe something from your current findings or things also? Yeah, I mean, um, some of the topics that I think are very important to look at now, and that again comes back to the point about managing also controversies or maybe identifying them in the first instance, is for investors now to look at addressing ESG or anti-ESG sentiment, I should say, you know, hand in hand with a lot of these greenwashing and competence washing activities that are going on in the wider industry and, and how they actually also see in managing policy challenges very much at the sovereign level to address these systemic risks around climate, around biodiversity. Another book I've, by the way, just completed the handbook on biodiversity this year. So hence, you know, really addressing the challenging side of the equation for ESMG. You know, we currently see that there's increasingly a disconnect on how systemic ESG issues are being understood, how they're being identified, and then how they're being managed and engaged upon from a, a corporate also versus a sovereign level slash engagement perspective. And, you know, there's been an interesting report by Morningstar in April of this year, and that highlighted that there's a rise of anti-ESG shareholder proposals, very often going hand in hand with the stance now on looking further towards anti-climate lobby, lobbying um, that's actually currently on the rise too. And ultimately now to hone down on all of these different proposals to understand how they contribute to a noise and to analyze the implications for longer term ESG decision making is becoming an absolute prerequisite. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. So with that being said, unfortunately, we have run out of our time. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today, sharing these insights. I'm also looking forward to the book. So, well, thank you so much. Great pleasure to, and speak very soon. Soon. Bye.